Good morning. morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I hope that you're glad to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 I want to start out by telling you today that I believe that I have today maybe, maybe the most important message that I have ever shared with you guys. Um... I really hope that throughout the message you will pay very close attention because it's it's not important what I say per for you know from my own opinion it's important though what I say that God has directed that he wants you to hear today so um, having said that let's bow our heads for prayer just now Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege and the honor that I have uh, to be here this morning. And I thank you for each and every person who has made it a point to come and gather in your name to worship you. And I ask just now that you would prepare our hearts and minds to be able to receive the message that you have for us today. We want to Just yield ourselves and give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so um, I have entitled today's message, The Kingdom of Heaven is at Hand. And I I want to actually start out just by saying that the other day I went to Walmart in Carthage. And as I was walking up to the store and getting ready to go in, I noticed that there was music playing outside outside that you could hear. And um, it was being played by the store. Uh, I'm gonna give you a guess as to what kind of music that was. Christmas music, that's right. Okay, so then I walked into the store, and when I walked into the store, immediately I began to see what types of products. Christmas products, okay. So things are going on in the world, and they continue to go on where, okay, Everything about life is basically different, but there are certain things that continue on, like this whole thing of a focus on Christmas, right? Okay, well, I want you to know that we understand Jesus' birth date was not December 25th, right? We understand this. We know that. Yet, we, we take the opportunity, because people's attention are on the birth of Jesus, so we take the opportunity to, to sometimes uh, magnify that or celebrate it or whatever. Well, today, thinking about then the, what is uh, beginning to be on everybody's minds, Christmas, and for, for many people, much more than usual, the birth of Christ or the coming of Christ, the first advent. I want to then think about that first advent a little bit more in terms of Jesus had a contemporary, um, a cousin. His, His mother, Mary, had a cousin named Elizabeth who was pregnant at the same time that Mary became pregnant. Now you'll remember that Mary actually she she was in scandal right I mean it looked like she, she was unfaithful to God and all of that but we know that God God caused a miracle to ha- happen in her and and that the child was from God Jesus right Amen. and Joseph you'll remember was going to put her away quietly because he didn't want to bring shame and reproach on her right? But he was going to put her away before he understood what was going on. He was going to put her away quietly. But do you remember that Mary went to go see her cousin Elizabeth, who was much older and also was pregnant at the same time, right? Okay, so when Mary came into the presence of Elizabeth, what happened with the baby that was in Elizabeth's womb? It began to jump. Who was the baby who was in the womb of Elizabeth? John the Baptist. Okay, so John the Baptist 
is the cousin of Jesus, right? Yes. And you'll remember that John's role was to make way, as it were, yes. for the coming of the Lord. Isn't that right? And he, it, it was so such a profound thing that even while he was in the womb, he could sense the coming of Jesus coming into his presence. Well, I want to talk to you about John and his role and what he had to say and what that means for you and I today. Because believe it or not, the message of John the Baptist back a couple thousand years ago is more than relevant for you and I today. Okay? So, we're going to delve into this today. Um, prepare the way of the Lord. So when John the Baptist was grown and came into his own, he began to preach all around the, the area of the region of the Jordan. And he began to preach this message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was his message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, so... It's interesting to me that that's the message that God sent to who? To his chosen people. Remember that Jesus came to his own and his own did what? So John was coming preaching a message. Remember that the Israelites, the Jews, they were God's chosen people, right? They had the, the truth, man. They, they had the, the Bible. <laughs> they didn't have the New Testament yet. but They had the Old Testament. Right? And, and they were the people who were expecting the coming Messiah, weren't they? Right? Yes. And it was to these people that God sent John to say, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen. So, it's interesting to me that, you know that... Um, John baptized Jesus, yeah. right? First of all, I mean, he became very, very, very popular. People were flocking to him out to the Jordan because the Jordan River was crystal clear, right? No. No, no it was muddy. It was dingy. But that's where he was doing his baptizing was in the Jordan, right? And, and we, we know that Jesus came to be baptized by John. And, and we, we know that when John saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world, right? And then when Jesus came up to John and, and talked to him about being baptized, John is like, Look, I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus said, We have to do this, for in doing this, we'll fulfill all righteousness, right? Because Jesus is our example in all things. He is showing us what we need. So, John baptizes Jesus. The Greek word is baptizo. And it means to immerse. It does not mean to sprinkle. It means to plunge beneath, to immerse And John baptized Jesus. And when Jesus came up out of the water, there was a voice from heaven. What did it say? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in bodily form like a dove, right? Yeah. And we know that immediately the Holy Spirit led him out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan for 40 days. Now that's not wilderness like around here. That's wilderness like 
desert-like. Okay? And so he goes out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan for 40 days, right? He fasts the whole time. You know this. By the way, we know that Jesus overcame the temptations of Satan during that 40 days. How did he overcome? What, what was it? By the word of God. That's right. He would say, it is written. So when Satan met him with a temptation, he would meet him with the word of God and say, it is written. And see, he knew he was in battle and he was rightly applying the word of God. Right? And listen, everything about the, the spiritual armor, think about the spiritual armor for a second. The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the, the belt of truth, the, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, um, the shield of faith. All that is defensive armor. But the word of God, what part of the armor is that? It is the sword. It is the only offensive piece of armor. And that's how Jesus overcame, right? It is written. And he dealt with the issue. And then Jesus came back from the wilderness and he began his public ministry. When Jesus began his public ministry, his message was, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's the same message that John said, right? The same verbatim. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, when John was preaching this message, he is trying to get the people ready to receive the coming Savior. Now the Savior bursts on the scene. And he preaches the exact same message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What is supposed to be happening in both scenarios when John is preaching and when Jesus is preaching is that a people are to be making ready for Jesus to come. That's what is supposed to be happening in both of these scenarios. You are making ready for the coming of Jesus into your life, into your heart, and you being in his kingdom. Does this make sense? Yeah. Today, we as a church, we are called to herald the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 through 12. Amen? Amen. Now, in my estimation, those three messages can be summarized like this. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I believe that it is still the same call. Prepare for the coming of the Lord so that you can be in his kingdom. This is the call that God has given through his people throughout the ages. Now, I want to move into this concept of repentance. I want to read from Luke chapter 3. So if you brought your Bible, would you say amen? amen. Very good. What we're going to discover is, is, first of all, we're going to discover some things about uh, baptism, because we're talking about, of course, John the Baptist, all right? And that's for a reason. His, his uh, ministry was focused around baptizing people. And, and let's begin in verse 3. I'm going to tell you that we're dealing with the time in which the, the priests Annas and Caiaphas were in office as high priest. Now, keep in mind that Annas is on his way out. He's retiring and so forth. Caiaphas is the new high priest. And it's during this time, because remember, that's who Jesus' mock trials were in front of, right? Yeah. Both Annas and Caiaphas. So it, it's during this time when John comes preaching. 
And he says, uh, it, it says in verse four, uh, excuse me, verse three, and he went into all the region around the Jordan preaching a baptism of what? Of repentance. Preaching a baptism of repentance. That's interesting terminology. For the remission of sins. A baptism of repentance. Okay, we're going to get into that further in, in just a little bit here. Um, verse 4. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough way is smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. I want to ask you something about that passage right there. First of all, we, we know that we're dealing with the, one, the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Who's, who's that referring to in, in Isaiah's prophecy? John the, Baptist. John the Baptist. Okay. Now, John the Baptist, he was a very uh, uh, well-dressed and uh, upstanding-looking citizen, right? Now, listen, John the Baptist was a Nazarite, right? So he had, his hair was just completely grown. It had never been cut. And I'll tell you something else. His attire was a little odd. He had camel hair for his clothes, right? And, and what else? His diet was unique too. Yes. He was out there eating locusts and wild honey. And this is who the people were flocking to out into the wilderness, out by the dirty Jordan, to be baptized by this man. And so, it says here, his voice is crying, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled. Every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough ways smooth. I want to ask you something. What does that mean? What does it mean that the, the valleys are going to be filled up? What does it mean that the mountains are going to be brought low? What does it mean that the crooked ways are going to be straightened out? The rough place is smooth. What does that mean? We, we can conceive of, well, that's, you know, making way for the Lord. But what does that actually mean? What is that terminology applying to? Is it applying to geography? No, they're using geographical terms, but we are, we are talking about who, who is he trying to address? He's trying to address the people of God. What has to be made? Let me, let me put it this way. It's people. Yes. It's people. The high-minded need to be brought low. The, the, the people who are crooked and perverse, they need their ways straightened out. You rough around the edges, it needs to be smoothed out. Why? Because Jesus is coming. Yes. And he has to have access to his people. Let's, let's continue to read. I'm going to pick up in verse 7. So we're in Luke chapter 3, verse 7. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him. This is John, right? Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? I'm going to stop right there. Wow. What is a brood? What? Say it again. Oh, kind of. It's, it's more specific. Family. Offspring. That's right. So he's like saying, children of vipers, you offspring of vipers, who warned you? Now listen, it, I know it says here in Luke that multitudes came out and he said this to him. In Matthew, it says when the Pharisees and the Sadducees came out, that's how he addressed them. Pharisees and the Sadducees... Uh, who are those guys? Religious leaders. That's an easy way to describe it. 
The Pharisees were experts in the law. Right? Not just the Ten Commandments. We're talking about the first five books of the, of the Bible, of the Old Testament, that are known as the law. The Pentateuch, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All the books that Moses wrote. Right? Experts in the law. And, and, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees are the religious leaders of the day. And this is a society that is based upon the idea of being God's chosen people, the ones who are awaiting the promised Messiah. And their leaders, the experts in this book, are the ones John says, brood of vipers. Who warned you about the judgment that's coming? Man, oh man. I'm going to tell you something. And I know you hear me say this occasionally. I, I need to remind you. It doesn't matter if you are a seventh generation Adventist. What matters is if you are yielding your heart to Jesus Christ. Can, can I get an amen on that? Amen. I'm going to read on. It says in verse 8, Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Listen, and remember what the, the covenant was that God made with Abraham? He was going to give him descendants. How, how, how many descendants? Yeah, like the sand of the sea or the stars of the sky. I mean, uh, uh, countless you can't quantify it. I'm going to give you so many descendants. And, and this is all about being in the covenant with. And, and the, the Jews are thinking, hey, we are direct descendants from Abraham, Father Abraham, right? We're his sons. We're the chosen ones. We're the envy of all the earth. And I'm going to tell you something. Today... The fact that you sit in a Seventh-day Adventist church and you have special knowledge imparted to you. Do you believe that? Yeah. Do you believe that you have some, some amazing truths that have been revealed to you that are, are not common knowledge to a lot of people around the world? Listen. Do not for a moment get high-minded because God could raise up from the stones children for Abraham. We are Abraham's seed how? By faith. We are Abraham's seed by faith. Now, I also, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm distracted for just a moment. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you will continue to have your way here. I pray that you will guide my thoughts and my words that I might speak your words and not my own. In Jesus' name, amen. So, as, as we continue to deal with what is happening there at the baptism that John is performing, which is a baptism of what? Repentance, repentance that's right. A baptism of repentance. Um, now, remember he said, you know, you say, hey, we, uh, we have Abraham as our father. And then he goes on to say, God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Look at verse 9. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What trees is he talking about? Yes, he's talking about human beings. What kind of human beings? Who is he referring to here? He is referring to the Jews. Listen, and this is not anti-Semitic. This is, what I'm saying is the chosen people of God. The chosen people of God. That's who he's referring to. The ax is laid at your roots. What does that mean? You're going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. Look, there's a parallel between the Adventist church and the Jews of old. 
You do know this, don't you? So, I'm going to continue to read on. Notice what happens in verse 10. So the people asked him, saying, what should we do then? If the axe is laid to our roots, what should we do? And it's interesting how John responds. In verse 12, or verse 11, it says, He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to one who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. What, what is it being said there? Yeah, don't be selfish. Share what you have. Don't just look out for yourself. You have to use your life to help bless the life of others. Right? Let's, let's look on. The tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? Now listen, this is the response. They're coming out to be baptized and they're asking, So what should I do then? Because this is a baptism of repentance. Right? And to repent means what again? To turn away. Okay? And in fact, the, the Bible, uh, excuse me, the uh, uh, original... Um, language in, in the Hebrew and in the Greek both refer to a, a changing of your mind. Yeah. I changed my mind about that. And it's to the point of I'm turning away from it. Yes. I changed my mind about the sinful pursuits that I had and now I'm turning away from that. Not because I'm strong, not because I'm clever, not because I'm wise, not because I've figured it all out, but because I I know that that is against what God wants. And so I'm turning to God and I'm running to him for help and for hope. You know what I'm saying? It's repentance. Yes. Which we're going to get into, my brother. All right. So um, picking up then with... Um, verse 13, after the tax collectors asked what they should do. He says, it says in verse 13, and he said to them, collect no more than what is appointed for you. Why does he say that? Because they've been corrupt. They've been taking more taxes than they deserved. It's lying in their pockets. Right? And then in verse 14, and likewise the soldiers asked him, saying, and what shall we do? And so he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. Look, wh what I'm getting at is this. In, in this call to repentance, in this, uh, this baptism of repentance, John is calling for fruits of repentance. And they're saying, so what does that look like? And he addresses them where their real lives are being lived. You tax collectors, don't take more than what, you, what is owed. You soldiers, quit intimidating people. You know, qu quit falsely accusing people. Don't complain about your wages. Those of you who are selfish, share what you have. And, and he's addressing the character and the actions of the people. Now, I want to take a look at Romans chapter 6. If you'll turn there with me, please. Romans chapter 6. We're going to read thir the first 13 verses of the chapter. Okay, Romans chapter 6. If you're there, please say amen. amen. All right. So beginning in verse 1 then. By the way, um, I, I want to point out that... Um, well, uh, let's just read first. What, what shall we say then? Paul is speaking here. He's speaking to the believers at Rome. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Listen, he just got done making the, the point where, where, where sin abounds grace much more, right? So he's saying, so should we continue in sin so that grace abounds? And now he says in verse 2, certainly not. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And then he gets, he gets real specific here. 
Or do you not know that as many as a, of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his what? Death. His death. I want you to think about, I know we've talked about this before. It's important. So we're going to talk about it again. Up here in this baptistry back here, you've, you've heard when, when we've been preparing to baptize someone and, and we talk about the fact that when they are baptized and we deal with the Greek word, Greek term baptizo, which means to immerse, right? When we talk about being baptized, when someone goes beneath the water, what happens to their breath? It stops because it symbolizes death. When they come back up out of the water, what happens to their breath? <sighs> because now it symbolizes I have died to myself and I'm living unto Christ. Amen. Death and resurrection. Death to sin, life to Christ. That's what that represents. In fact, we're going to let Paul explain it a little bit more here. Um, in verse 4, it says, Therefore, we were buried with him, how? Through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in, what's that? Newness of life. In other words, your life is not supposed to look like it did before. Let me say that again. Your life is not supposed to look like it did before. That's why it's called newness of life. That's why John was doing a, a baptism of repentance. And he was saying that you should be bearing fruits of repentance. So now, going back to the text here, um, in verse 5 it says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his what? Resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. But alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. That you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as being instruments of righteousness to God. Let me ask you something. What are your members? What is it? Your body, your body parts. So I shouldn't continue to use my body to be a slave to sin. I should be living in newness of life and presenting my body to be members of righteousness so that my eyes are beholding that which is pure and that I might see the need in others so that my mouth is speaking the truth and, and kindness and praises are on my tongue so that my, my hands are engaged in meaningful 
good labor and, and, and helping those who are less strong. You get, you get the idea, right? What is standing out to me is that we need to repent. And that doesn't just mean that I say it with my mouth. It means that I show it with my life. See, baptism is an outward symbol of an inward transformation. Right? Because we don't want to have a form of godliness that denies the power thereof. We don't just want to be religious people who are actually missing the boat. You know how Jesus referred to that? You're, you're whited sepulchers. What's a sepulcher? A grave, a tomb. So they whitewash it on the outside so it looks nice and pretty. But inside it's all dead. We don't want to have that. Where it looks like we're conforming, you know, and, and we're very religious by outward appearances, but inside we don't have the life of Christ, the Spirit living within us and producing those fruits of repentance. I need to share with you something from Steps to Christ. Listen, usually, usually in my sermons, I mean, I, I use, um, you know, the writings of Ellen White very much in my preparation for sermons. Um, I don't often just break out the book and quote to you. Um, but that's what I'm going to do today. And I'm going to use the book Steps to Christ because there is a chapter entitled Repentance. And I want to tell you something. This, to me, I know this can be argued and people have their opinions. From my perspective and my opinion, this is the most important book on the planet besides the Bible. That's what I think. Why? Because it talks about practical Christianity. How I can truly, in actuality, have a transformative relationship with Jesus Christ. And it teaches about that. So I'm going to start on page 18. Again, it's in the chapter entitled Repentance in the book entitled Steps to Christ. And it says, we can no more repent without the Spirit of Christ to awaken the conscience, then we can be pardoned without Christ. Can you be pardoned without Christ? Is there any, any hope of being pardoned without Christ? Zero, right? Zero. He is our only hope of being pardoned. And it says here, that you can't repent anymore without the Spirit of Christ, then you can be pardoned without Christ. You have to have Christ do this work for you. It is a gift He gives to you. He calls you. He woos you. He leads you to repentance. It's His work. This, I'm, I'm going to read to you now something that is very sobering. This is on page 19. One ray of glory, one gleam of the purity of Christ 
penetrating the soul makes every spot of defilement painfully distinct and lays bare the deformity and defects of the human character. It makes apparent the unhallowed desires, the infidelity of the heart, the impurity of the lips, the sinner's acts of disloyalty in making void the law of, God, law of God are exposed to his sight and his spirit is stricken and afflicted under the searching influence of the spirit of God. He loathes himself as he views the pure, spotless character of God. When the light of God's truth and purity and righteousness and his true love shines into your heart and you begin to recognize your own depraved condition, your own polluted heart. You are actually overwhelmed by your own unfitness for the kingdom of God. But God is calling us. He is calling us to a repentance. He is calling us to have a transformation take place in our lives. We don't want to die just being churchgoers. We don't want Jesus to come back and somehow that that miracle of transformation with it where his spirit is living within us has not taken place with us. Oh, we were around it. We were in the right place and we did a lot of the right things. We knew the right people. But we never let him do that work inside that needed to be done. That's not an acceptable scenario, is it? I want to uh, take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to read verses 9 through 11. If you're there, would you please say amen? amen. Very good. So I'm going to begin reading in, in verse 9. And it is interesting what is said here. Um, by the way, just keep this in mind. This is Paul's letter to the believers who are in the city of Corinth, right? That's why it's called Corinthians, okay? And he's saying to them in verse 9, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, like we just read about in Steps to Christ, when, when the light of God's truth shines in your life and then you're sorry for all of, all of the defilement and depravity that you see in your own life, right? He, sa he says, I... I I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow did what? Led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer, that you might suffer loss of, uh, from us in nothing. In other words, we've brought you the words of truth, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And, and we don't want you to lose any of that. And this, this godly sorrow is not going to produce a loss of that. And now in verse 10 it says, For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Amen. Godly sorrow. Remember, Jerry, I told you we were going to talk about sorrow for sin, right? Amen. Godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world, that produces what? Amen. Death. Godly sorrow produces repentance that leads to salvation. Worldly sorrow produces death. Verse 11. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. What is he saying? You were showing fruits. 
The fruits of your repentance are visible. Now I see you as zealous and diligent. And you see what I'm saying? Yes. Now I'm going to give you a warning. It's also from the same book, Steps to Christ. Going over to page 20. First, first I will give you hope. Oh, Lord, help us all. Yes. If you see your sinfulness, do not wait to make yourself better. Amen. How many there are who think that they are not good enough to come to Christ? Do you expect to become better through your own efforts? Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? Then may ye also do good who, that are accustomed to do evil. In other words, you can't change yourself, right? You can't change yourself. There is help for us only in God. We must not wait for stronger persuasions, for better opportunities, or for holier tempers. We can do nothing of ourselves. We must come to Christ just as we are. Don't think I got to take care of this thing. I got to straighten that thing out. I got to get this under control. And then... Because I'm going to tell you something, there will not be a better opportunity for you than today. Amen. There will not be a better opportunity for you than today. Here's a stern, no, not stern, alarming warning. Every act of transgression, every neglect or rejection of the grace of Christ is reacting upon yourself. Yes. It is hardening the heart, depraving the will, benumbing the understanding. And not only making you less inclined to yield, but less capable of yielding to the tender pleading of God's Holy Spirit. What does God want from me? Isn't that what they were asking when John, when they came out to John? What should I do? How do I respond to this? You're calling for repentance. How do I, how do I respond to this? And John would lay out some things. Calls for a change in your conduct, right? Yes. <clears throat> When we were in board meeting the other night, we had a, a devotional time where we dedicated ourselves to God and we called upon Him. to work in this church. When I say this church, you know that I don't mean this building. I mean this people. Amen. As we were talking about the ability to change and so forth, and we, we were approaching prayer, Brother Steve made notice 
that sometimes to really see the hand of God move when it seems like you've tried so much and you've come to the point where it just doesn't seem like what's happening needs to happen. Sometimes there is a call for fasting too, for prayer and fasting. And I want to read to you just from the pulpit commentary. Um, just, this is interesting to me. It's, it says, prayer invokes the aid of God and puts oneself unreservedly in his hands. Fasting subdues the flesh, arouses the soul's energies, and brings into exercise the higher parts of a man's nature. Thus equipped, a man is open to receive power from on high and can quell the assaults of the evil one. I want to share something else on this. This is from the Review and Herald back in 1904. A quote from Ellen White. And it says, Now and onward till the close of time, the people of God should be more earnest, more wide awake, not trusting in their own wisdom, but in the wisdom of their leader. They should set aside days for fasting and prayer. Look, I, I'm not standing before you as one who has some kind of a, a higher exaltation in my life or, or I've achieved some kind of holiness level. Not at all. I stand as one among you who has the, the position and the opportunity to be able to speak to you about the truth of God's word. And I found, find myself among you, just, just with a different position, just a different opportunity, but I am among you. We are in this together, right? And I'm saying... I think we really, really need to look at this thing of repentance much more seriously than we have. Yeah. And one of the ways that you can make a breakthrough where you haven't before is through prayer and fasting. And fasting. I'm going to be calling for some decisions at the end of this message today. By the way, that's why I was late today, because we were calling for decisions in Neosho. And three people out of five present made a decision for rebaptism. Two for first baptism, one for rebaptism. I'm going to read to you something else. I know I'm doing a lot of reading, but this is important. What I'm going to read to you now is from a book entitled um, True Revival. And in the first chapter, that is, the, the subtitle is The Church's Greatest Need. And I want you to listen because I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs. Listen to this message, friends. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. There must be earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord, not because God is not willing to bestow his blessing upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give his Holy Spirit to them that ask him than our earthly parents to give good gifts to their children. But it is our work by confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant us his blessing. A revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. While the people 
are so destitute of God's Holy Spirit, they cannot appreciate the preaching of the word. But when the Spirit's power touches their hearts, then the discourses given will not be without effect. Guided by the teachings of God's word, with the manifestation of his spirit, in the exercise of sound discretion, those who attend our meetings will gain a precious experience and returning home will be prepared to exert a healthful influence. The old standard bearers knew what it was to wrestle with God in prayer and enjoy the outpouring of his spirit. But these are passing off from the stage of action. And who are coming up to fill their places? How is it with the rising generation? Are they converted to God? Are we awake to the work that is going on in the heavenly sanctuary? Or are we waiting for some compelling power to come upon the church before we shall arouse? Are we hoping to see the whole church revived? That time will never come. There are persons in the church who are not converted and who will not unite in earnest prevailing prayer. We must enter upon the work individually. We must pray more and talk less. Iniquity abounds and the people must be taught not to be satisfied with a form of godliness without the spirit and power. If we are intent upon searching our own hearts and putting away our sins and correcting our evil tendencies, our souls will not be lifted up unto vanity. We shall be distrustful of ourselves, having an abiding sense that our sufficiency is of God. Yeah. Listen to this. We have far more to fear from within than without. Sometimes you think that the evil is out there. That that's what you got to get away from is all of, the, all of the wickedness and the sin that is out there. We have far more to fear from within than from without. The hindrances to strength and success are far greater from the church itself than from the world. Unbelievers have a right to expect that those who profess to be keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus will do more than any other class to promote and honor by their consistent lives, by their godly example and their active influence, the cause which they represent. But how often have the professed advocates of the truth proved the greatest obstacle to its advancement? The unbelief indulged. The doubts expressed, the presence of evil, and, 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 excuse me, the unbelief indulged, the doubts expressed, the darkness cherished, encourage the presence of evil angels and open the way for the accomplishment of Satan's devices. Whew, that's a lot. I'm going to turn to Isaiah chapter 55. I, I know many of you are, are very familiar with this passage. That's okay. Isaiah chapter 55. I'm going to read verses 6 and 7. Isaiah 55 verses 6 and 7. If you're there, would you say amen? amen. <clears throat> Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the un unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Amen. Friends, Today, you have been gifted. You have been gifted with yet another opportunity to respond to God. 
I want to point out something in Hebrews, so turn with me there to Hebrews chapter 3. We have to decide how we're going to respond. In Hebrews chapter 3, this is very telling. I, I'm going to read verses 7 through 15. So Hebrews chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. If you're there, please say amen. amen. All right. <clears throat> I want to, before I read this, so, so pay attention. Don't, don't read ahead. Just track with me for a second. We'll read it all together. What is going to be talked about in this passage are the people of God after they came out of Egypt, you know, when they were slaves and, and the Red Sea parted and they were brought out in, from Egypt and remember that God was leading them where? Promised. To the promised land. And they came up on the edge of the promised land and they rushed right in and they overtook it, right? No, they sent out spies. How many of them? Twelve of them. They spied out the land for how many days? Forty days. When they came back, ten of those spies were saying, there's giants in the land. There, there, there's giants. That, we're like grasshoppers to them. Two of those spies, two of the twelve, said this is a land flowing with milk and honey. Let's go. Who, Steve? Joshua and Caleb. Well, we know that the crowd listened to the ten. And they ended up not going in. And because they didn't go in, they ended up wandering in the wilderness. A year for every day that they spied it out. Forty years. When they came out of Egypt and, and they came across the Red Sea and all these miracles were happening, right? Every single day miracles happening. Anyways, when they came out, there were more than a few. There were more than a million. How many adults exactly? I'm not sure. But by the time the 40 years was finished and they got to go back to Canaan... How many of those original adults got to go into the land? Who were they? Joshua and Caleb, the ones who gave the faithful report. They were the ones who believed when it looked like this is impossible. They were the ones who believed, well, this is what God says he's going to do. So let's join in and let him do it. In the end, do you realize that your salvation is impossible? Unless God does it. You have to join in with him and let him do it. Or you'll be like the others who die in the wilderness. Never seeing the promised land. I'm, I'm going to read on. In verse 7, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of the trial in the wilderness. See, that's what that's referring to. Where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. And they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. 
my friends, I am going to ask you today, how many of you, how many of you feel like you need to repent? Notice my hand was up. I'm going to take it further. How many of you feel like you ought to have the baptism of repentance, that you ought to be baptized or rebaptized? Can you raise your hand again, please? I'm so humbled by all of this. I just don't even know what to do except to, to pray. I want to ask you too, how many of you would be willing to enter upon a season of prayer and fasting? Good. Good. If you're able, will you kneel with me? If you're not, God knows you're bowing in your heart. Father, it is only because of your grace and your great love that we even have this opportunity to respond to you again today. You see us and you know us. There's nothing hidden from your sight. And you are calling us to repentance. To turn away from our sin and our selfishness, our wicked ways. And to turn to you. We cannot make ourselves holy or righteous or, or pure in your sight. That's your work. But you are able to present us faultless before the throne. And I pray right now in this place that you will meet us right here. You know our condition. You know the state of our, our mind. Our, you know uh, what, what we're going through in our lives. You know the, the condition of our relationships. You, you know the habits that we hold. You, you see everything just as it really is. And so we're coming to you just as we are. And what we want to say, Lord, is, is please forgive us. Please forgive us for our sins and, and cleanse us from our unrighteousness, Lord. We know that our sins caused you to die the worst kind of death. And we do want, not want to crucify you afresh. I pray, Lord, that you will begin a new work in us. I pray, Father, that you will help us to have that repentance that 
you know, this, this godly sorrow that is leading us to the, the repentance that helps us to take the stand and turn away from the things that are outside of your will for our lives. To trust in you. To let you do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. To transform our hearts and renew our minds. Oh, Father, I, I don't even have the words. Pour your spirit out on us and among us. Do something we have not experienced before. Reach us deep down inside, Lord. Change us in the inward, man. Make ready your church, Lord. I pray in the wonderful name of Jesus.